chapter 30 is where we'll be this morning. And as you're taking your Bibles and turning to Psalm 30, uh, we will dismiss our youngsters, uh, 12 years of age and under, can head down to Children's Church at this time. 30, uh, yeah, yeah, Psalm 30 is where we are, but 12 and under for our children. And appreciate, again, our children's workers and the ministry they'll have to our young people today. And that would be great. Amen. All right. Well, there they go. They are off and literally running. We're going to thank the Lord for the blessing. Uh, and then I want you to, I'm going to give you a, a question, at least to give me some response. It's not super profound, but I hope it will be a good lead in to where we want to go here this morning. Let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for, again, just the opportunity to be here with you and your people. And we do believe that you're present with us. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, we can sense your presence here this morning. Uh, Lord, it's been good to sing your praises. Uh, truly, again, you alone are worthy of all of that. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that we can participate in worship. It's not something just that we do as a spectator, but we are active participators. And I pray that our hearts and souls have been knit together in song and in prayer. Uh, Lord, uh, even now as we again pray, uh, Lord, we've had opportunity to certainly have a, a vital part of worship by way of our giving, again, indicative of our faith, believing that all that we have has come from you, and we now give you a portion of that back. So, Lord, uh, we're a blessed people, and we want to thank you for allowing us to come together on, on your day to worship you, a God who is truly worthy of our worship. We do pray that as we continue uh, this, this time of worship, uh, we, uh, we open up this sacred book, a book that we have enjoyed over and over again. May today be no different. May the Holy Spirit of God be our teacher here this morning as we look at a particular psalm here. I pray that you'll use uh, this psalm to really challenge us anew and afresh in our endeavor to be the people you'll want us to be. And Lord, for that, we'll thank you. Lord, if there's unsaved in our midst, may today be the day of salvation. Save souls would be our plea, uh, for we realize that that's, uh, that's crucial uh, for eternal life. It's crucial for living the life that we ought to be living here on earth. And so help us, Father, and for that we're going to thank you. We want to commit all this to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I want to just begin this morning here by asking you a question. You can give me a little bit of feedback here. We won't take this question too far or too long. But uh, I want you to answer the question, like, how would you spot a Christian? Um, you're in a crowd. Uh, you're with a bunch of uh, people. And by the way, I thought it was kind of timely to even ask this because uh, Christmas parties are going to be starting up here, no doubt, soon. So you might have some uh, Christmas gatherings at the office there or your workplace. You might have family gatherings. Uh, Lord willing, you may have one this coming Thursday. Uh, and so you're going to be with people. That's just the nature of us. We gravitate toward other people. We enjoy that. And, uh, and it might be a mixed crowd. There may be some believers there. There may be uh, uh, many unbelievers there. How do, you, how do you spot a believer? What, what, what would kind of rise to the surface and say, boy, there's something different about that individual here? How do you pick out the Christian from a crowd of people? How would you do that? Uh, now, by the way, I don't think it's limited to just one area here, but I want to kind of hone in on something here in particular. So how would you spot a Christian in a crowd of people? And the answer to that would be somebody, anybody. Okay, their behavior. So you would look at the way they conduct themselves, the way they carry themselves, all right? So, so they are going to be a little different uh, than maybe the other people, and there's reasons. They have convictions, and so they don't necessarily want to carry themselves as maybe some other unsaved people in that midst, all right? So you're looking at their behavior. Sure, that's going to be uh, apparent there. Good. How else would you detect that? And, and by the way, you're going to get engaged in conversations with some of these people, and so, so you might walk away from after talking to one of them saying, boy, you know, I kind of wonder if that person isn't a Christian. Maybe you didn't come flat out and ask them that, but how would you, how would you kind of sense that maybe that one is more of a, uh, is a Christian more so than other people? Certainly, they're looking at the behavior. Give me something else, Derek. Okay, so they might be wearing some jewelry of some sort uh, that might indicate okay that uh, they lean that way. Um, the dress, maybe the dress would certainly again, again be uh, indicative of a person. They don't maybe necessarily dress as the others. Maybe they do blend in, but, but it's modest dress or something. Uh, so, so their dress, maybe some of the jewelry might raise some question in your mind. Uh, maybe that person's a Christian. Okay, good, good. I'm thinking, yes. 
you have a conversation, and certainly in the conversation, I think it's very helpful. I want to encourage you to do this, to flat out ask them if they're a Christian, all right? I really believe that you and I are to be a light in this world, and in the world in which we live, there's a lot of darkness, and there's darkness in our workplaces, in our classrooms, in our family, extensive families. Uh, and so I hope and pray that God will give you the boldness to just flat out ask, hey, are you a born-again Christian? And don't just stop with being asking them if they're a Christian. Don't, don't do that. You know why? Because there's a lot of people who are Christian. They go to church. Maybe they got the jewelry on or whatever it is, and that doesn't make you a Christian. You know, there's only one way to be a Christian, and that's to have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And that's something that takes place. Every person has to own up to the fact that they are sinners in need of a Savior. It's not church attendance, okay? We've already been through all this. Uh, but, but I would ask them, are you a born-again Christian? And the reason I throw that born again in there, that will stump them, all right? If, if they're not Christian uh, or they're not, they're going to question that, well, I don't know about that born again, but I'm a Christian. Okay, well, why are you a Christian? And that certainly gives you something more to feed on, all right? Okay, all right. So this, all right, this is last but not least, Jack. Very good. That's good. Amen. Amen. Uh, you bring up an interesting point, Jack. Uh, the, I remember we had an elderly lady uh, went to the hospital. I think she had to have her hip replaced or whatever. And so she's in uh, the hospital bed recovering from the surgery or whatever it was. And the nurse came in and flat out asked her that question. Now, I don't know what the rules of the hospital are and what you can do, but, but this nurse asked our lady who was in the hospital bed if you were a born-again Christian, something along those lines. And the, the born-again Christian who's sitting in the hospital bed lit up. I mean, it was exciting. I mean, can you imagine a nurse or somebody coming in, a doctor or whatever, saying, hey, by the way, are you a born-again Christian? That would make your day. That made this lady's day to know that this lady cared enough to ask a question about my eternal destination. She asked if I was a born-again Christian. Now, again, I don't know what the ethics are as to how you can do that legally in a hospital as a because you've got to be careful and teachers and all kinds. There's all kinds of rules today. But this is going back many years ago, and I, I remember that lady telling us. She said, I was pleasantly surprised when this nurse asked me if I was a Christian, and boy, we had a wonderful conversation. And I thought, boy, what a way to brighten somebody's day. A, a fellow Christian, as Jack points out, you're going to light up. You're not embarrassed. You're excited about that. Hopefully that would be you. And uh, by the way, if you have roommate there, uh, that's okay. They can hear that conversation. Speak a little louder that day so that they can hear what's going on between the two Christians as they converse one with another. So that's all important. But I'm going to take it a little bit further. I want to tell you, I'm, at least the direction that I want to go in, especially since it's the month of Thanksgiving, I want to go with the area of thanks. I really believe that one way that you can detect that there's something unique about a person and all the things that are said are true. I, I'm not denying any of that, and I'm not saying that they don't certainly factor into all of this. But I would say that an individual who has the attitude of gratitude kind of gives us some kind of indication that there's something unique about that person. I have shared with you on, on numerous occasions that the uh, Anglo-Saxon root to the word thanksgiving means to think. People that are thankful are thinkers. They are thinking of what they have, of what, what they have been blessed with. And it's something that's, that's on their mind. And it's, as the sign out front says, not limited to a day, but a lifestyle. If you are an individual who have been saved by the grace of God, I hope you never get that off your mind. I hope that's always on your mind. God reached down from the glories of heaven and saved my soul, and I wasn't worthy of that. And I never want to stop thinking about that, and as a result of thinking on it, I'm going to be thanking him and others as well. I really believe in the day and age in which we live, to spot Christians, you're going to, you're going to hear Christians who are, again, expressing thanks. Now, listen, I'm not saying that that person in that crowd, that workplace, that that family gathering, whatever, is saying, oh, thank you, God, for saving my soul. I'm not saying they said that. But in the course of the conversation, this, this, this idea of gratefulness will somehow surface. They might say, hey, it was nice to meet you. Thanks for the conversation. Somewhere along the line, thanks will maybe be shown. I hope to God that you and I are people who are filled with gratitude and thanksgiving to the great God that he is. I really do. And so, you know, again, just, just 
analyze your own life. When was the last you said thank you to anybody? I, I hope you say it to your spouse. I hope you say it to your kids. I, I hope you say it to your coworkers. I, I hope that I hope it just rolls off the tip of your tongue. I really do. Listen, if you have a job, you ought to be thankful. Amen. You see your boss sometimes. Hey, thanks for the job. You might not like your boss. You may not like what he stands for. Hey, listen, hey, he's, he's the, the God's appointed authority over me, and I have a job, and thank you, Lord. And I want to thank them and let them know it. So, you know, we began this year by talking about praise the Lord ought to roll off the tip of our tongue. I hope that that's still the case. But here is certainly the idea of thank you. That, that ought to come. That ought to, that ought to be as natural to you as, as a duck in water or a duck on a beautiful day like today. I mean, it ought to be natural. It ought to be something that's there. And if thanks isn't there, oh, man, I'm going to tell you, you better go back to the, you go back to the drawing board here and t- take a look at it. Why am I not so grateful? Why am I not so thankful? Why don't I express thanksgiving? Something's not right there. I really believe that, that God's people are to be thankful people. And, uh, and I think it ought to be something that's very natural. So if it isn't where it ought to be, then you pray to God that uh, starting today it's going to be, and it's not going to be limited to just this week or one day of the year, but it will become part of your lifestyle. And that's what I'm saying. You walk away from a crowd, and that person expressed gratitude, uh, maybe for a number of things you were talking about or whatever, um, You know, I think, again, you can just say, boy, there's something different about that individual. Even on a beautiful day like today, you know, you can say, thank you, Lord, for the rain. You know, now you may not like this rainy, cold, damp, dreary day. But, hey, listen, you can find something to thank God for it about, can you? I hope so. We need rain. Uh, I'm thankful that I have uh, have ears to hear the rain uh, uh, sounding off on our roof here today. Uh, We have eyes to see it. Uh, Find something to thank God for. And express that, again, maybe not quite as vocal by way, thank you, God, for, but you can find thanksgiving. Hey, I want you to look at Psalm 30, and in particular, verse 4, and this is a unique area here. I want you to look at verse 4 quickly here. The Bible says, sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and look at this, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. You know, this is a unique message. I've never preached anything on thanking God for His holiness, but I really got a blessing out of this message. And so I hope and pray that you can get the blessing that I got out of this message. I I never, I don't think I've ever thanked God, in particular, just for holiness. I I probably thank God for who He is, uh, and, and maybe listed off a number of His attributes. May have done that. I say may have because it's a shame that I can't remember doing that on a regular basis. But the psalmist here hones in on just one of his attributes. And he is reminding the readers of this particular psalm here that we are to thank God at the remembrance of God's holiness. I hope and pray that God will bless this message to all of our hearts today. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to talk about the holiness of God for a period of time, not long. That's not the whole point of the message, because I already believe that many of us would know something about the holiness of God. But let's just be reminded of a few things about the holiness of God, and then I want to try to bring some application to all of this here. So if we were to describe the holiness of God, we would say that it is an entire freedom from moral evil. When we talk about God being holy, he is free from any moral evil. Uh, There is absolute moral perfection. By the way, when we talk about morals, what do we we mean by way of morals? What is morals? Morals are that which is right versus that which is wrong. Who sets the standard for morals? God does. God sets the standards. How do you know what is right? God told us what is right. How do you know what is wrong? God told us what is wrong. How do you know that stealing is wrong? God said it's wrong. How do you know adultery is wrong? God said it's wrong. How do you know that, that uh, husbands are to dwell with their wives according to knowledge? Because God said it was right. I mean, there's right versus wrong. Amen? We got that. So, so when we talk about God being holy, he set the standard for moral perfection, and he is complete in it. He is completely uh, set apart from anything that could be imperfect when it comes to moral values. So he is pure, he is incorruptible, he is without spot, he is set apart. Now listen, are we there? Are we morally uh, pure? No, no, we're working toward that end, but we're not there. We have not arrived. And uh, as we were talking about in our class this morning, we ought to be becoming more like Christ. We ought to be becoming purer and purer in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. But we're still not there. We're not God, never will be God but we're striving to be perfect even as our Father in heaven is perfect. 
So we get that. Then I got to thinking about a couple things uh, by way of some challenges I, I received this week here. I want you to think about the burning bush for just a minute here. In Exodus chapter 3, uh, we've been studying that all long year. Uh, Let my people go has been the theme of our Sunday night services. And I personally have enjoyed my, our study here, so I hope that you have as well. But I want to go back to the burning bush where a lot of it started. You remember Moses was out there in the wilderness and he sees this bush. And it's burning. It's on fire and it draws his attention. He comes over to the bush. You remember what God says to him immediately? What did God say to him as soon as he draws close to that bush? That's exactly right. Take off your shoes for you're on holy ground. What made that ground holy? What made that little piece of real estate that Moses was now walking on holy? Why did God say that it was holy? Yes, it was the very presence of God. Now I want you to think about that little burning bush there for a second. I thought it was kind of interesting. The ground was holy. The flame did not burn up the bush. And it revealed to us at the same time that the flame did not need the bush to burn. God, our God, is a consuming fire. That bush relates to the holiness of God. If the flame did not need the bush to burn because it was complete in itself, then that would mean, now listen, that there was no residue, no smoke, no soot, no ashes. There was only a perfect flame, the self-radiant light and heat of God's virtuous, pristine being. Here's this bush, and it is on fire but it doesn't need the bush to burn. It is complete in itself. And because of this holy ground, the presence of God there, he's giving us a picture into, he's giving us some insight into the very character and nature of God. God's holiness relates to his majesty, his sovereignty, his glory. God is glorious in his holiness. Some of these attributes are going to kind of blend together. And by the way, you can never really separate them from God. Like, you couldn't take goodness away from God and still have the same God. No, God is good through and through, and it cannot be separated from God. God cannot be less good. He is entirely perfect in his goodness. God is holy. You can't separate any ounce of holiness from God. He is set apart. He is pure. He is, uh, he is uh, 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 perfect in, again, in, in the morality uh, of issues. So all of these things, righteousness, God is right in all of his dealings. You're going to see that there's, there's overlap between the holiness and the righteousness and the justice and, and the, the mercy and all of these things that deal with God. But I want you to think about God's glory as it relates to God's power, his might. His glory relates as well to his holiness, for his holiness is glorious. Okay, here's a passage of Scripture. Just kind of wrap your mind around for a few minutes as well. You know this one as well. The, there's only two places in all of Scripture where the attribute of God is repeated three times. The only, and it's the same attribute. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, you know the passage. You don't need to turn there. But, but Isaiah catches this vision of God seated on a throne, high and lifted up. He hears the angels, and, uh, and they're flying, and they're crying out. And what are they crying out? Are they crying out, love, love, love? Are they crying out, just, just, just? No, no, they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Here it is. The whole earth is full of his glory, glory, again, revealing the holiness of God. It is repeated again when you get to the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, where you have again these uh, four beings uh, that are there at the throne uh, uh, with the church, the 24 uh, elders that are gathered there. And there you hear in Revelation chapter 4, these angelic beings cry out to God those very same words, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. God's holiness is awesome. It really is. It's, it's, it can be alarming, 
But I want you to reflect on it because the psalmist is reminding us to remember his holiness and as we remember the holiness of God, give thanks to him for it. So I want you to think about the holiness of God because it can be alarming. It can be awesome as well as you reflect. It's beautiful and attractive. It's a wonderful thing to think on God's holiness and to be moved to thank him for it. Now, we could talk about a number of different psalms that certainly refer to worshiping him and the beauty of holiness and on and on and on it goes. But here's where it gets interesting. So we could go down this trail and preach a whole message dealing with the holiness of God. And listen, that would be a powerful message in and of itself. But I, I got to thinking, why, why is the psalmist challenging the believer to, to, to thank God for his holiness? As verse 4 says, give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. What's, what's the application and where does this go? And so uh, I, I began to reflect on this and I got pretty excited about this. The reason that we are to give thanks at the remembrance of God's holiness is he shares his holiness with us. And unholy people become the recipients of the holiness of God. Now I want you, to, I just, you got to think about this here. It's not simply an attribute that belongs to God, but God in His grace and mercy has shared holiness with us. God is holy and challenges us to be holy. A couple different verses. We looked at the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. We could be reminded that we are to be partakers of the holiness of God. We are to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. How can a holy God require sinful man to be holy unless, unless he does something for sinful man? And he does. He reaches down from the glories of heaven and he gives us his holy son. And his son says, you believe on me, you can again be made holy in me, through me, because of me. And so as a believer, I can become holy because of my relationship to God through Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to stay with all of this here. When you came to Christ through faith in Jesus Christ, you were made holy. You were set apart unto God. Now, by the way, one of the words that we use with regard to a church, it's a different word. It's the word ecclesia. means called out ones. What is the church? The true church is comprised of believers who have put their faith in Christ and the finished work of Calvary, and it began on the day of Pentecost, and it will go all the way up to the rapture. So we're already 2,000 years into this called out ones called the church. If the Lord tarries, there's going to be more added to the church. As more people come to understand their sinful condition, cry out to Christ to save them, they will be added to the church. We believe in that universal body of believers that recognize Christ as their Savior. It's all over the world. It's been around for a couple thousand years. But when they came to Christ, something changed. And as I shared with, uh, again, uh, our class uh, a week ago, I don't know about you, but I know this for a fact in my own life. When I asked Christ to be my Savior, I had no idea what God was doing in my life. All I knew was I was a sinner and I needed Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I asked him to come into my heart and save me because I needed him. And he was the only one that could save me. But boy, there were a number of things that took place that day. Uh, I like the one here where it talks about that God gave us his son. And it talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us. Why? That we might be made, now listen, the righteousness of God in him. I was again declared righteous the moment I asked Christ to be my Savior so that when God looks on me, he sees the righteousness of Christ applied to my account and my standing before him is right in his eyes. Not because of any greatness on my part, but because of what Christ did for me the day I asked him to save my soul. And it's in that same vein, just as I have received his righteousness, I received his holiness. So this really leads to a message that deals with what we would call positional sanctification and as well progressive sanctification. Positionally, here's how it works. When you get saved, you are set apart unto God and no man can take that from you. 
we believe again that you are saved and, and in Christ, and there is no man that can pluck you out of the Father's hand nor out of Christ's hand. You are secure in him. Positionally, you are set apart the moment you ask Christ to save you. And I hope all of you here today are saved. If not, could today be the day of salvation? It needs to be the day of salvation if that's the case. Positionally, I was set apart. We would look at a number of different verses that, that deal with this whole idea here. Uh, but now, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You know what the, the, Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus? Hey, there was a time when you were separated from God, but now he sees a difference. You are in Christ. When did that take place? The moment you asked Christ to be your Savior. You were placed into Christ. And as being placed into Christ, I became the recipient of things that pertain to Christ. Doesn't make me God. I'm just saying that God in His goodness shared that with me. Galatians chapter 3. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all, here it is, one in Christ Jesus. We get that picture, right? I hope we do. That's called positional sanctification. That took place the moment we got saved. But here's the application of all that. What difference does that make to us here today? Well, I think it makes a huge difference because just as God saw fit to save me and set me apart unto him, he's not finished with me. He's perfecting me. He's, he's still at work in my life. Uh, there's, there's still rough edges that need to have some sandpaper taken to it. And God is, is still in the business of shaping me and molding me into the image of Christ. That's what, that's what God the Holy Spirit is seeking to do. Now, here's where it gets really neat. As God perfects me, and as God perfects you, we become a blessing to each other. We ought to become a blessing to each other. This whole idea of progressive sanctification is that we are in a process of being shaped and molded into the image of Christ. And it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Don't confuse it with positional sanctification. No, when you got saved, you're set apart unto God, and, and that can never be removed. You are His, you are a child of His, and will be forever. That's a wonderful thing to rejoice in, and that's a message in itself. But I want to tie it in with the Thanksgiving season and this idea of giving thanks at the remembrance of the holiness of God. Why? Because that has made me and it has made you a blessing to other believers. I want you to think of uh, some of these things. Um, let me just uh, give you a, maybe an example of about uh, of, of being washed clean. Um, babies. Uh, remember, remember when you had babies in the house? Maybe some of you still have a baby in the house. And uh, that baby needed a bath. And uh, you washed that baby, and at least in our house, we used to use, I don't know, some kind of baby shampoo on their hair. I, I can still smell the baby shampoo. I mean, I just get that, ooh, that baby smells so good. I mean, I mean, you wash that hair, and maybe the baby magic, I guess, you use baby magic back, and you wash that baby all up, and man, when that baby comes out of that bathtub with all that stuff roll, uh, washed, uh, put all over the baby's body or whatever it is, and man, you smell that baby. That baby's like, whoa, I'll hold that baby. Let me hold that baby. I like to be around that kind of a person. That baby smells good, looks good. You comb the hair, you get it all fancied up and look at it. You want to be around that kind of a person. Now, when the baby has other issues that are taken care of in his body or whatever, that's when you say, Mom, the baby needs some help here or whatever. No, you don't do that. You go change it yourself. Right, Dad? Okay, yeah, sure. I know. Hey, listen, clean people are good people to be around. I like to be with people that are clean. I really do. Just as you can relate to a child, you know, and, and uh, it's no problem to pass that baby off from one to another uh, when the baby's clean and looking good. Hey, listen. Do you know that's what it is with the body of believers? When you've been washed clean in the blood of Christ and you are progressively getting closer to the Lord, you become attractive to other people. You're the kind of person that you want to be with. I like to be with clean people. Do you like to be with clean people? Hey, you know what? I'm going to thank God at the remembrance of His holiness because He has seen fit to share His holiness with us. And as He shares His holiness with us, we become attractive one to another. And it's enjoyable to be with those kind of people. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, you know, I always, I always get a kick out of uh, Eileen, your sister here, uh, Diane. She, she is incredible. So this past Wednesday night, she just blessed my heart. Just, it's just a little zinger. 
You know, and I'm sure Diane didn't even mean to say, you know, like what she said. It just comes out so natural out of her mouth, and it was such a blessing. She said on Wednesday, I can't wait for Wednesdays. She loves to come to a midweek service where we spend time in the Word and then pray. It's not a lot of glam and glory here, folks. There's no special music. We don't sing 20 songs. We just get into the Word and then spend some time talking to God. But she said that as if, again, it was as natural and, and it just... But you know what? It, it, it hit me. Whew. Now, I could be reading into it, but here's what, I, here's what I'm going to take from that. You know, it's, it's a pretty nasty world out there. It's, it's a pretty dirty world out there. There's something special. There's something special, folks, about coming apart, getting out of the dirt and the filth of the world and coming to be with clean people. Oh, not perfect people. Oh, no. no this church is far from that. <laughs> You've been here any length of time. You probably already found that out. No, there's not a perfect church on the face of the earth. But we've been washed clean in the blood of Christ. And Christ isn't finished with us. He's still perfecting us by way of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, changing us and challenging us to, to, to be cleaner and cleaner. You know, here's how it works. You remember again, okay, so we went from the baby who comes out of the bathtub with the baby magic and the hair all done and all that stuff. Okay, so then you get that child that's maybe five or six years old, and you tell that child it's time for a bath. The five or six-year-old kids like baths. As a whole, it's like, oh, really? I got a bath last month. Isn't that good enough for a while? No, no. You got to go get a bath. And so what do you do? You tell that child you got to go to the bath and maybe help him get a bath. You go fill the water or whatever you got to do. But you, you get them in there to get them washed and get them clean. What happens to that child after, after he becomes a 15-year-old or an 18-year-old? Are you still telling that 18-year-old, you need to go get a shower? No, no, by 15, that child has matured enough to understand that, hey, you know what? I need to be washed clean. I don't like the way I smell or look or whatever it might be. And, and so there's no, there's no encouraging a, a 15 or 18-year-old. They know it. They go get it. Hey, folks, that's the way it is spiritually speaking. When you were a young person, you, uh, you got saved in, in Christ. Praise the Lord. But maybe somebody had to tell you, hey, listen, as Christians, we don't talk like that. Or as Christians, uh, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't do that. Or we don't participate like that. We don't do that. There's something different. And you, maybe as a young Christian, Lord, you had to be reminded of that. But as you mature in Christ and, and, and the Holy Spirit of God continues to, to shape and mold us, you begin to see things differently. And you understand, boy, why did I just say that? Why did I do that? Why did I go there? And so you begin to, you begin to bask uh, or, 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 or bathe yourself, as it were, in the, in the pure water of God's word. And you get washed yourself. Now, again, I like to be around people that are clean. And that's something, again, that comes from the holiness of God. Here's something else that comes from the holiness of God. You know, you know people that are saved, positionally set apart unto God, but progressively becoming more like Christ, they, they bear fruit. You know what some of the fruit they bear? They bear love. Hey, does anybody here like to be with unlovely people? No, there's enough unlovely people in the world that as a believer, I don't want to be one of those kind of people. I want to be a person that is filled with the love of God, the love of Christ. And so I, want to, I certainly want to exhibit that by way of what I talk about, how I reflect, how I carry myself. How about joy? There's a lot of people that, that are just down in the mouth. They're, they're just miserable. You can't, there's nothing that can make them happy. Do you like to be around those people? I don't personally like to be around them. I like to be around people that are filled with joy. I like to be around people that are at peace, peace with God, peace with themselves. Not perfect, but hey, listen, this is who I am. I love to be around people that put up with me, long-suffering. Hey, folks, you can go right through the, the, uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit. But you know what? This You wouldn't have the fruit of the Spirit if it weren't for the holiness of God. God who is set apart sent his son so that he died for us so that we could be set apart unto him. And as we're set apart to him, we begin to give evidence of this in our walk with God. And so the fruit of the Spirit becomes evident. Thankfulness rolls off the tip of our tongue. We want to live clean lives. Folks, that's the kind of people I enjoy being with. And I sure hope you enjoy being with them. Because it is a, a, a doggy dog world out there. It's, it's, it can be a rough world. But there's something special about the people of God getting together. And so I would remind you of the psalm here where the psalmist says, 
Oh, give thanks, he says uh, in this particular, or, or he says, sing unto the Lord, O ye saints. And by the way, the word saints is also set apart ones of his. And give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Uh, I will tell you that uh, Kendall Park Baptist Church is, is, a, is a blessed church in a number of ways. And I don't simply say that because I'm the pastor of the church and I'm supposed to say this. But, but I think it's been evident uh, already here in the last couple of weeks here that we are a compassionate church. I think we, we really have a, a, a real concern for people and a, a real compassion for souls. Uh, I think we are giving church, evident again by way of what uh, was already shared here this morning. Uh, there are some great things that can be... Hey, listen, I like to be around those kind of people. I benefit from being around those kind of people. I'm thankful that I can remember the holiness of God, that who He is, He shared that with me. And he's shaping and molding my life to that end. Well, we could look at a number of other verses uh, to that end. But uh, I just remind you of a couple that we are, again, people that are to be perfecting the holiness of God and the fear of God. We're to be a people who are not called unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. We are, again, challenged by way of Peter that we are to be holy in all manner of conversation. That's our behavior. Why? Because it is written. As he is holy, we are to be holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And so I would hope and pray that, yes, that question that we began with, how do you pick a Christian out of the crowd? Well, no, no doubt the way they conduct themselves, uh, the way they dress, the way they talk. Uh, there's a number of different evidences that Christians ought to exhibit. But certainly one of them ought to be, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Little things, big things. But here's what I want to never forget. I want to be thankful at the remembrance of the holiness of God, because I am what I am, because he shared that with me to help make me what I ought to be. And so for that, I am very grateful. I want to close with a little uh, story here and a little uh, quote from John Wesley. How much good, how much of a good thing do you desire? John Wesley said this, I want the whole church for my Savior, or, uh, so I, want, I, want, uh, I want the whole Christ for my Savior, the whole Bible for my book, the whole church for my fellowship, and the whole world for my mission field. How much of God do you want in your life? How much of a good thing do you desire? The story is told, that, and it's dated, it goes all the way back to the maiden voyage of the space shuttle Discovery, that's back in 1984. A microscopic broken wire in a backup computer was found to be flawed. The broken wire was an integrated circuit within one of the Discovery's five identical computers, which controlled all of the ship's functions. Four of the shuttle's computers performed specific tasks. The fifth, which suffered the broken wire, is a backup. It's designed to replace any of the other four. Any one of the five computers can fly the shuttle, according to their, 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 their spokesman. But when the four computers detect an impulse that there is a problem with the backup, they'll vote to stay on the ground. Now, I want you to just kind of get the picture. Five computers, four are running this shuttle. Any one of those four can run it independently. There's a fifth one, and that's the backup one. It has a microscopic wire that is broken. This fifth one here can back up any one of these four. But remember, any one of these four can run that shuttle. But the four of them sense something's wrong over here. Just a little wire broke. Hey, we got four of the computers, and we're good to go. Let's take off. You know what the four say? Nothing doing. Something's wrong with number five. Five's got to get fixed before we launch. We're not going to, But wait a minute, wait a minute. One's good to run this thing. Two's good. Three's good. Four's good. But no, nope. Five better be ready to go in the event something goes awry. On a mission to space, there are no unimportant parts, no matter how microscopic they may be. The mission depends on each and every part being fully integrated and fully functioning. Even the backup parts play a critical role in the safety and success of the mission. What's the application? In the church, 
there are no unimportant parts. As a body, we must be turned into each other to detect impulses that could send the signal there's a problem. Then seek out that hurting part to heal and restore fellowship, communion, and integration with the rest of the body. The Bible will tell us in the book of Ephesians, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That simply is reminding us that everyone sitting here today, if you name the name of Christ, you play a vital role in the lives of people in this body, this assembly of believers. It's not coincidence. It's not, oh, well, I just happened to be here. No, I believe that God has you here for a reason. And I really believe, again, it's because of the holiness of God that you're even here. It's because that God is such a holy God, and yet he shared that holiness with us in the person of Jesus Christ. And the psalmist nailed it. He really did. I want to give thanks at the remembrance of God's holiness because he shaped me and molded me into who I am today. And that helps me to be a blessing to others as well as receive a blessing from people as I gather with the body of believers. And so, folks, uh, God has done something special. And this Thanksgiving, again, I, I, again, I've never thought about thanking God in particular just for the holiness of God. But I, I know that that message has spoken to my heart here. We could, again, study the attributes of God, and that would be quite all right. But to think that he shared it with us and helped me, again, be a new creation in Christ. I'm different than I was 40 years ago. I'm not the same person. And if I have another 40 years, I hope I'm not the same person 40 more years from now because of the holiness of God. He's at work. He's at work in my life. He's at work in your life. Will you let him work? Is he doing something great? Are you becoming more like Christ? I hope and pray you are. Amen. Let's pray.